Okay, we will, uh, we're about ready to get started here. So I wanna give you, uh, I wanna give you guys one more lecture on interferometry to kind of give you a more modern application of the Fourier, of the Michelson interferometer. Uh, it kind of goes, uh, obviously based on our last lectures, it goes without saying how important it was in the history of physics. But I also wanna highlight in this course, because part of, part of this is to you know, teach you optics and teach you the physics of light. But I also wanna show you some modern day applications of all this stuff. So I think one lecture on how, for, how Michelson interferometers are used in, in research labs today uh, is kind of a cool thing to see. Uh, so in particular, uh, they can be used to do spectroscopy which means measuring uh, absorption versus wavelength or transmission versus wavelength, reflection off of something versus wavelength. And of course, this is super important in chemistry and atomic physics. For instance, you guys probably remember uh, doing uh, a spectroscopy experiment in modern physics where you measured the uh, absorption and emission lines of the hydrogen atom. Can you guys give me a hand in Zoom if you did done that experiment, just so I know that I'm talking to you guys about something you've done. Okay. So if, uh, if not, so you guys didn't do that experiment then? At some point I thought it was standard, but maybe, uh, maybe not. Well, uh, I guess give me a hand then if you understand the idea of spectroscopy. So do you understand like the idea of measuring absorption versus frequency or wavelength? Do you know what I'm talking about there? Okay, so some of you guys have seen it, some of you not. I have a kind of a slide to uh, uh, kind of describe how those things work. The basic idea with spectroscopy is the goal is to measure what we call the spectrum. How much light is emitted or uh, absorbed by a material or transmitted through a material versus wavelength. This can tell us a lot about the material properties of a, of a medium uh, what the electrons or the charge carriers or the atoms in a gas are doing, how they're absorbing energy. It's how we experimentally measure the uh, energy levels of quantum systems like the hydrogen atom. So it's a useful experimental technique. Uh, basically, the way it's done at visible frequencies is to make use of some of the properties we talked about and one thing we're going to talk about uh, in coming weeks. So a basic system for a, uh, uh, to measure spectroscopy, to measure uh, light that's emitted from something versus wavelength would be like so. We might have like our excited hydrogen gas or whatever we're looking at. For now, let's just say it's an excited hydrogen gas is giving off light. And we wanna see all the different wavelengths it's emitting. So this gas is all like, we have some like container over here full of hydrogen gas. So then we excite it, we knock all these electrons loose, they go up to high energy levels, fall down, and then they emit, off, they emit light. So they emit photons according you know, to quantum mechanics, whatever the allowed energy levels are, so on and so forth. Here I have one emitted color shown. Doesn't really, I forget what the actual wavelengths are off the top of my head. That's not really important for the lecture. But what we can do to kind of distinguish between these different wavelengths is we can use, for instance, a CCD camera here with a you know, high pixel count. So like very high, uh, well-resolved camera that could see changes in light at very fine distances. We could use a lens to collect all this light, so to collimate it and then hit it off this thing called diffraction grating. I'll talk about that in a second. But for now, with just one color of light, this basically acts like a mirror. 
that then hits a second lens, which focuses it on the camera. What happens that's interesting is if we take this next step and we include the fact that hydrogen can give off light at multiple wavelengths. So what the diffraction grating does is, has a, as we'll talk about in a few weeks time, it separates light by color. So the reflection angle is going to be different for different colors of light. Overall, what that ends up doing is, uh, for instance, here, our green quote unquote wavelength and our yellow quote unquote, hit the lens at slightly different angles. The green hits dead on parallel to the optical axis, the yellow at an angle. And as we saw in uh, some of our uh, problems for ray matrices and uh, geometrical optics, what that means is that the focal spots are going to be displaced. They'll be all at the same distance from the lens, but the focus for the yellow light will be somewhat uh, displaced from the green. Correspondingly, if, we, if hydrogen emitted or whatever our gas is emitted a higher wavelength, it would also be focused at a different point on the other side of the axis. So what this allows us to do is that different colors are focused to different points. And if our camera had small enough pixels that could resolve these different focal points, it could see the different, uh, basically measure the intensity of the different amounts of light we have. We then take our data from the camera convert that into an intensity measurement, and we can make a graph of emitted light versus wavelength. So for our gas here, we might see three peaks at whatever these three different wavelengths are. And the reason we're able to do this is all due to camera technology, ray optics, and basically this uh, property of the diffraction grating that where the reflection angle is proportional it depends on the wavelength of incoming light. It's designed for a certain wavelength, and as you move away from that, the angle changes. But we'll talk more about that structure in weeks. Uh, show of hands, does this concept make sense to everybody? All right, I got half. Does everyone else not understand or have you not found the hand button? I don't know where the hand button is. <laughs> okay, uh, so you can find that. Uh, let me see if you click on the manage participants. Where is that? Uh, you should be able to, it's in like the Zoom menu. So like the menu on the bottom of the screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you should have it should open a list of everyone in the in the meeting and then there's you should have an option for raise hand ah there it is okay found it obviously you could just say i understand but hopefully that makes sense this concept makes sense to everyone any uh any questions overall nope yeah so this is this is basically the way spectroscopy was done uh since we started doing it for visible wavelengths. Of course, in times past, before we had digital cameras and things, uh, what you would do is actually have to use a telescope uh, that was built on a protractor, and then you'd have to change the angle to find out where the line was, and then you'd have to measure the angle of diffraction, and then use the rules of diffraction grading to figure out what the wavelength must be that you're looking at. And uh, this is basically how experimentally, you know, lines in the hydrogen atom were measured, giving us the experimental measurements of the energy levels. Uh, and so this is the way things work at visible frequencies and often at, at infrared wavelengths that are near visible. However, if you wanna do this at smaller wavelengths, for instance, in the mid infrared or far infrared, uh, this doesn't really work very well because it, one, it gets harder to make diffraction gratings and prisms at those frequencies. So we, we really need to find a different way to separate out these different colors. Uh, and you can do that, but it involves really playing, uh, playing some tricks with interferometers and using the math of Fourier transforms. So 
we, uh, I'm going to talk through how we do that today, and it's called a Fourier transform spectroscopy, and it uses a Michelson interferometer. It's a really cool, like neat, you know, current application of interferometers, and you find these things inside commercial boxes in chemistry labs all over the world to do infrared spectroscopy. Uh, though you want to know by looking at it that inside it's a Michelson interferometer. So here's some things we have to uh, uh, think about. So instead of, since we don't have a way to separate the different colors, we really need to think about uh, waves where uh, the overall wave is made up of a bunch of different wavelengths or frequencies. So before we get into the math, I just kind of want to talk a bit here about, so we have one of these waves, which we might call a broadband wave. It means it made, it's made up of many frequencies. Here I'm showing two. And we want to think about what happens uh, when these two waves are added together and uh, the overall wave we would see. So what you can imagine if you look at this graph, there are going to be points I mean, you guys have seen graphs like this before. There are going to be points where the waves, you know, basically destructively interfere. And we're going to have zero amplitude at those points. Other points in the wave where they almost constructively interfere, like right here, where we're going to have a really high amplitude. So overall, we're going to have the amplitude changing with time. And more or less, how quickly will that change? Well, if here with our cartoon example of a wave made of two different frequencies, we could estimate how long it takes to go from a high to a low to destructive interference. It's how long the two waves take to go out of phase. So basically what we can do is take the phases of, a, of the two waves and subtract them. When that difference is equal to two pi, that's going to end up, if we solve for the time involved in that phase, that will give us basically more or less the amount of time it takes for the waves to go from constructively interfering to destructively interfering and back again. Uh, this concept, even though we're only doing it with two waves, you can still define, at least think about it conceptually, for waves made of multiple different frequency components. So th this time is given a special name. It's called the coherence time. And basically what it is, uh, it measures how long, if you look at a wave, if you watch a wave go by, if you watch this total wave E of Z of T go by, and you watch it for a really long time, you will see these increasing and decreasing amplitudes, which in intro physics classes are often called beats. However, if you, uh, if you watch this wave go by for a time that's shorter than this coherence time, you really won't see much of a change in amplitude. Basically, if you watch for a time shorter than this, you probably would think it's just a normal sine wave. If you watch for a time longer than this, you start seeing the constructive and destructive interference effects. And basically, that's what it means. Uh, if you watch for a short time, things look like a very simple wave, and we say things are coherent, quote unquote. If we watch for a time longer than the coherence time, we start seeing all this destructive interference start happening. We see the amplitude decrease and increase. And we say that after that time, the two waves have decohered, meaning they're no longer kind of in line with each other. So really what I care about, uh, you see these terms come up anytime you have waves that are engaging in interference. If you do quantum mechanics for long enough, you will start talking about coherence times of wave functions and things. Uh, but it's a general wave property. How long does it take for two waves of different frequencies to start destructively interfering if you watch them for long enough? So taking this up, so we could think about we're not going to do it mathematically, but we could think about taking this structure and think about overlapping. Take a wave that, like, let's say, so we have a big broadband wave made of many frequencies that's being emitted by a gas or a material. Uh, 
And if we were able to, we could put it into a spectrometer and break up all those frequencies. Uh, unfortunately, we can't because we don't have the prisms or the diffraction gratings for these wavelengths. But what we can do is think about taking that beam of light, putting it through a beam splitter, breaking it up into two parts, and then overlapping them. So here's an example of that. Here we have a wave. It's made up, its frequency is changing with time depending on how the gas or material is emitting photons and the frequency of those photons. So over here at the beginning, we have a higher frequency wave represented by a bluer color. And then it gets a bit lower, lower, increases in frequency again, and then decreases. So I'm using, I'm not changing the actual space between the crests and the troughs. It's just kind of too hard with PowerPoint. But hopefully you get the idea with the colors. So if you uh, break the up, this light into two beams and you overlap them kind of with zero delay. So you immediately overlap them. You should see that there's always constructive interference. So you'll see here, you know, the two waves, the frequency, the overall frequencies are changing, but they're changing in time with each other, such that crests always overlap with crests, troughs always overlap with troughs. If you delay them by about half of a period, you will always get destructive interference. However, if you, de delay the, if you delay the second wave by a time more than the coherence time, eventually the frequencies you no longer have similar frequencies lining up with each other, and you don't really get any sensible uh, constructive destructive interference pattern. So you'll get no bright spot, no dark spot. It'll just be kind of a mix of the two waves. The thing is, is that this property of overlapping, breaking a, a beam into two, overlapping them and measuring the constructive and destructive interference is a way that we can figure out what frequencies are involved in the wave. So what kind of different frequencies make it up. Uh, and as we know, we can split a beam uh, using a Michelson interferometer and bring it back together and overlap it. We can also move the mirror in a Michelson interferometer to change the delay and thus move from these different situations. Uh, and this is actually going to allow us to uh, tell us how much intensity there is for the different frequencies of the wave. So how much intensity there is for this high frequency part, for these lower frequency parts as well. Uh, so in fact, it allows us to do spectroscopy by measuring the interference, whether you have constructive or destructive interference for, uh, for a varying delay position of the mirror. So how this works actually invo it involves a lot of math that I'm going to summarize very quickly. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to make sure so one more time checking with the hands. Uh, do you guys get the concept uh, so far about how we're overlapping with these waves? You might not see how, uh, how this is going to give us the spectrum yet, but the idea of what we're going to do. So just to highlight, we're splitting a beam into two, and one of these, uh, One second. Uh, one of these waves here, so yeah. So, like this wave here will be the beam going through one arm of our interferometer. This beam here will be the other beam going through our interferometer. There, now this time, the frequencies of the wave are changing. And as long as we could change the mirror position on our interferometer to change the delay between the two beams. And as long as we, as long as we keep that delay smaller than the coherence time, I'm not saying that we have a way to measure that right now for this complicated wave, we can still have the interferometer work giving us bright and dark fringes. 
So if you guys do have questions, or maybe you're not following something like this, feel free to ask them either by voice or otherwise. Okay, well, again, this is a, this is going to be a complicated topic, but I'm mainly showing you guys so you can see an application of the Michelson interferometer. Uh, so don't worry too much if you're not going to follow all the math. In fact, I'm not going to go through the whole derivation here. Uh, but what I want to argue is I want to take a uh, theorem from the theory of Fourier transforms, and I'm just really going to state it on the next slide. So there's a theorem that's called the autocorrelation theorem. Don't worry about the name and don't really worry about the proof here. If you wanna go back to it later, if you really mathy, you can see it. All that really matters for us is uh, what's in the blue box here. And what it says is that this curly F here stands for Fourier transform. So what it says is that if you take a function and then a shifted version of the same function and you compute this integral, that no matter, and you compute the integral versus the, uh, versus the uh, shift between the functions, that this integral is equal to the Fourier transform of the function. We're not really going to end up doing this Fourier transform, but it's a useful, uh, useful mathematical property that's going to really help us. So as you remember, if we had a function of time, like a, a light wave, an electric field versus time. If we want to get the electric field or the intensity versus frequency. So that's really what we're doing in spectroscopy. Mathematically, that means we could do that if we could measure and compute the Fourier transform. So if we could somehow get the Fourier transform of this complicated multi-frequency light wave, that would tell us how much electric field we have versus frequency. So it gets around the idea of needing to separate out the individual wavelengths. So mathematically, what we're going to do is this autocorrelation theorem will allow us to use a Michelson interferometer to do a Fourier transform experimentally. And here is how. So if you want to go back, I'm not gonna make you repeat this proof or anything, and I'm not even going, I'm not going to, you're not gonna really be doing much math with this on the homework or anything. So it's really just more of an advanced topic so you guys could see something, uh, uh, some current work in this field. So let's go back to our, in, our interferometer where we're delaying this beam. So, so now let's assume that instead of having our one frequency, our light coming through is some pulse that has all these different colors mixed in coming from our gas or our material giving off the light. So our material giving off the light is somewhere up here. Then hits our interferometer and we break it into these two beams and we overlap them. One of the mirrors is on a delay and the overall output intensity is going to be as we determined, uh, as we determined a few lectures ago, is going to be the intensity of the two individual beams, the not delayed one and the delayed one, plus the uh, intensity due to this cross term, which, as you remember, gave us our interference. Thus, if you wanted to like if we measured this intensity versus time, what we could really do here is get the total intensity, integrate the total intensity, and it comes out to look like this. The two F naught term is a constant, 
that's just due to the intensity, the average intensities of our two laser beams, of our split beams. But then we have to integrate this integral here, which depends on the actual interference between our two beams. But conveniently enough, this integral looks exactly like that integral from our Fourier transform theorem. And that's where the utility comes in here. Give me one second, let me uh, change that box. So this is what we call the electric field autocorrelation because it makes use of this autocorrelation theorem. By that theorem, this integral, if we're able to actually measure it and compute it, will give us the Fourier transform of our intensity. It will give us the intensity versus frequency. And conveniently enough, using a Michelson interferometer, we could numerically compute this integral. So for instance here, notice that, for instance, if we take uh, this integral is worth versus delay time. So if we move this mirror one step, and then we measure the electric field of one way, the electric field of another, take their complex conjugates, square them, multiply by C and epsilon for vacuum, that will give us one term, like one time point in this integral. If we move the mirror again another step, do that same calculation, that gives us the next point in the integral, and we add that to it. If we move the mirror a third step, that gives us the third term in the sum that approximates the integral, so on and so forth. So if you guys remember like doing numerical integrals in uh, scientific programming in the modeling class, you approximated an integral as like uh, a sum of areas, and essentially, what we're doing here is the same. The amount we move the mirror determines delta t that we use to approximate uh, dt in the integral. Our intensity measurements here then approximate the integrand, e e star. And these are some constants. So all we have to do is move the mirror in equivalent steps, delta x, which correspond to a delta t, measure the overall intensity we see, and then we should be able to build up a graph representing this integral. So what we normally do here then is we do this experimentally. We just measure intensity at the, uh, at the output point. We subtract off this term, our two times our average intensity of the beams to give us just this interval. And what we can do is we realize that this integral, if we measure just the uh, integrand inside this and plot it, basically, if we Fourier transform whatever this function looks like, this function should give us our frequency spectrum based on that theorem. So, Really what I wanna do is show you kind of what this data looks like. If you make this graph, which in uh, chemistry labs is called an interferogram because you're measuring, your intensity is going to uh, increase and decrease whether you're uh, at a constructive uh, delay or a destructive time delay. And this is the function E E star that you build up by doing these measurements. The X axis is a amount of steps the mirror has taken. So it's the overall delay time. And then this thing if Fourier transformed is equal to the Fourier transform of our light, of our light source coming from the glass, coming from the gas. They're one and the same thing by that uh, Fourier uh, transform autocorrelation theorem. So I'm not expecting you to really like kind of, again, know why that theorem is true, but basically what it does, this theorem allows us to make this function. And then by writing a program to take the Fourier transform of this function, you can get the Fourier transform of your initial light signal. 
So it allows you to use a Michelson interferometer to do Fourier transforms on signals and thus get uh, spectrums which you could plot versus frequency, versus wavelength. A chemist, for some reason that I've never understood, like plotting spectrum versus K, the wave number, 2 pi divided by the wavelength. Uh, so what the actual like inferogram, interferogram looks like, if you take this measurement from the Fourier transform, is something like this. It's like really, it's usually really small, very close to zero. Remember, you can't use big delays because eventually your delay gets bigger than the coherence time. Uh, you stop seeing interference. But you'll see really, you'll see constructive points of interference, so constructive fringes. You'll see destructive interference where your electric field is zero. So you'll go from bright to dark fringes. Uh, and then you could plot them versus the delay time caused by that mirror position. And you'll get a graph like this. You can approximate that by a function and Fourier transform it. And that Fourier transform is equal to the uh, electric field or intensity versus uh, versus frequency for our light wave. So this graph that we get is the uh, intensity versus essentially frequency. So we could see, we'll see points in this graph after we do the mathematical analysis where there are drops in the intensity. And these are points where our gas must be, if we were sending light through the material, it's points where it might be absorbing light. So these might be absorption lines in our material. Same thing here. If we did a similar graph for a uh, gas that might be emitting light, this Fourier transform might look like this, where we have big peaks everywhere showing where the gas is giving off light. So it's a really kind of like deep and complicated idea. It uses a lot of mathematics you learn over like the four years of a physics degree. Uh, and it uses the Michelson interferometer. Uh, but this essentially allows you to do uh, spectroscopy, even when you don't have materials that function as prisms or diffraction gratings or lenses for those frequencies. So this has kind of allowed chemists to study things like water molecule or large molecule vibrations that really absorb and emit light at much lower frequencies outside of the visible range. This actual type of device is called a Fourier transform spectrometer. Uh, old school ones, this is one from the National Solar Observatory, look like this. Uh, but newer ones, you can get these compact that sit on a, uh, just kind of on a bench top that you could use in a chemistry lab and you just put in a glass container with a liquid or a sample. You could shine light through, measure the interferogram, and then compute the Fourier transform to get the uh, absorption versus, uh, versus frequency. And this is just something that could sit on a bench top in a chemistry lab. And uh, these things are usually called FTIRs, which means Fourier transform infrared spectrometer. You could actually make such devices now for like UV frequencies or visible, and they make these at all different uh, wavelengths. They still, for some reason, call them FTIR. Uh, I like to joke because uh, maybe it's because chemists don't know what a Fourier transform or infrared stand for, but that's not why physicists do the same thing. So it's a, comp it's a really complicated idea, but uh, one that, uh, at least right now, even really going through the full theory for a Fourier transform spectrometer is really something outside the scope of an undergraduate course. But I wanted to highlight this for you to show you that really what this thing is, is a Michelson interferometer that uses some of the mathematics from Fourier transforms uh, to do spectroscopy, even when we don't have the optical elements uh, to separate frequencies at that wavelength range. So it's a really cool idea that uses mathematics to get around an experimental limitation. And really, like, that's what I wanted to go over today. So it's an advanced but short lecture 
your problems are of course not going to focus on this, but I wanted to give you guys, if you end up working in uh, labs in the future, some of you may have, uh, may end up doing spectroscopy. You never know. You may end up using one of these devices. And uh, at that point, you may have to learn how to interpret an interferogram or uh, how to Fourier transform it. So this lecture might be a starting point for you. This is very common if you end up working in engineering or material science, uh, material science labs. And if you end up in that position, you'll really delve into this theory, but now you'll at least know kind of where to start and how it connects to the Michelson interferometer. Again, don't expect you to follow everything in this lecture, but this is one of those lectures to show you kind of what's out there. Uh, as for homework, the, only, the two homework problems I'm going to give you on the Michelson interferometer are now in the slides and they're posted. Uh, so you'll see they are here at the end of uh, Tuesday's lecture, so yesterday's lecture. So there are these two problems. Uh, they're now posted on the top of the Canvas page so you can go. You're not doing, they're not focused on Fourier transform spectroscopy, but mostly on what we talked about Monday and Tuesday. So if there aren't questions, uh, that's all I have for you today. Just an advanced lecture to finish, finish our discussion of the interferometer. And on Friday, we'll come back and start talking about diffraction.